find ourselves in an absurd place where minor sacrifices to preserve freedom now lead to violent backlash because they think it's leading to Hitler. Is our democracy robust enough to withstand a freedom without definition or a fear of a future Hitler that won't allow us to take even minor steps to stop a current slaughter? Welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. That was, of course, late night icon John Stewart with a clip from his new show, The Problem with John Stewart, which Apple TV Plus boasts is already its most viewed unscripted series ever. After stepping out of the spotlight for just a few eventful years in America and around the world, John Stewart is back with a new tone and a new mission. And joining me now, John Stewart. John, thanks so much uh, for joining us. So your last episode of The Daily Show was in 2015. Between then and now, there have been two presidential elections, two impeachments, an insurrection, a global pandemic. Was, oh. it, <laughs> was it frustrating to watch all of this play out uh, without it being your job to weigh in? Uh, it was, you know, I never really, the, the job was, was a nice way of going in and kind of working through all those things. You know, that was, I, I didn't miss the idea of, of having to comment on it on television, but I used to really enjoy, you know, going in in the morning with a group of smart, funny people and, and just talking about everything that was going on. It was just sort of a weird sort of, uh, old people sitting at a, at a counter at a lunch you know, at a lunch place, just talking about the day. So I missed that part of it. But, you know, it was like we had in, in one of the early shows, I think one of the audience members said, you know, you've missed so much over these past six years. And I, and I said, well, I, I was alive. I did, I did see it. I had, to, I had to wear a mask like everybody else during the pandemic. I didn't, I experienced these things. I just <laughs> didn't have a television show uh, by which to comment on it. The most recent episode of your show uh, tackles the, the very idea of freedom and democracy in the United States and worldwide. You had these activists on your show from Egypt and Venezuela and the Philippines to talk about the guardrails of democracy. And one of the things you asked them was if, if they think that Americans who are worried about the erosion of democracy, whether we are, you, me, others, are hyperventilating too much, um, mm -hmm. What do you think, and were you reassured at all by what they had to say? Well, to some extent, I, I, I was. I mean, I think, in general, Americans have a view of the country similar to that, you know, the sort of classic New Yorker poster of New York City versus the rest of the country. So it's bracing sometimes to hear the reality of people's lives in other countries as... It's not to say that warning signs don't exist or bells aren't going off or that democracy is a birthright and is something uh, that will always be with us as a kind of uh, a sash that, that we wear having been crowned the greatest democracy. But it did remind us that we have a long way to go before we end up in those situations. And it's kind of like, you know, watching a fable where you realize like, maybe the end of uh, a Christmas story where you're like, what day is it? It's Christmas day. Oh my God, that's great. I still have time. Like we still have time. But I think we see now that unfortunately the messiness of democracy is, is oftentimes maybe one of its greatest weak points in that we talk about protecting it in a way, you know, I, I remember there was, it was always, you know, the, the hyperventilating over, you know, Donald Trump is not normal. He's violating the Hatch Act. <laughs> and the most part, people at home would be like, I, I don't know what hatch you speak of. Uh, you know, people generally want prosperity and security. And, and if a democratic system is having difficulty providing that, or if it's being subverted by those who want to create chaos so that they can, you know, make a more author authoritarian government, that, that's part of it too. Listen, it's, it's nothing's guaranteed like that. And, the encouraging thing is watching on a grassroots level people that are really uh, viewing it as something that they want to protect and, and that they want to strengthen and working on those things on the ground. As somebody who, who worries about democracy every day, I do appreciate your 
you're, you're um, conveying of optimism right now. But we have a majority of the Republican voters out there who think that falsely that the election was stolen and who think it is an integral part of defining themselves as a Republican to say that Donald Trump had the election stolen from him. I mean, this is not only not going away, this misinformation, big lie, um, you know, uh, flirtation with autocracy. It's getting worse, I think. That's the worst bedtime story I've ever heard. Of. <laughs> it's you can fret about it, or you can go about strengthening those areas, and and I think that's the call to action here is you know action is the antithesis of anxiety. So if we've if we've identified the pressure points where the guardrails look most vulnerable, that's where we should be focusing so much of our efforts in terms of, of strengthening. We're adjusting to a new information and political ecosystem. And it's, it's, gonna, it's gonna be rocky. It felt like there used to be a, a sense of shame that existed at least to a degree about these sorts of mistruths or lies or disinformation that, that uh, and maybe I'm being naive, maybe I'm you know, being nostalgic. And, you are being naive, Tapper, <laughs> that's what I'm saying. But, uh, being naive. but maybe I am, maybe I am. But it did, it did feel like there was a time where if somebody's rhetoric, like Donald Trump's rhetoric, going after journalists or, or Democratic politicians or whatever, created somebody who actually was literally sending pipe bombs to news organizations, to politicians, that that would create a sense of shame and responsibility and that politician would, would tone it down. It, it, and we're like way beyond that. Nobody cares anymore. There's no incentive structure that's built for, other than if, if, if one, well, the, if shame doesn't exist. Yeah. But the consequence is loss of power. It's always been that way. You know, violence is part of our national heritage. I mean, we had a civil war for God's sakes. Right. And when the rhetoric gets to a certain point and the other side has been uh, treated like enemies of the state, well, then it, it, it makes sense. M my point is only that I don't think that dynamic is different. It's that the delivery system is more sophisticated, more robust, and more ubiquitous. And so the virulence of it kind of helps radicalize in maybe a faster way or a deeper way. I mean, we have algorithms that make sure that if you're starting to lean towards something bad, that you have to go, like, everybody just dips their toe into radicalism, and then the algorithm says, ooh, you like that video. Right. I've got a four-hour manifesto you've got to see. Right. Like, it's, we've created a machine that makes that kind of radicalization more efficient. And you were talking a second ago about identifying the weak points in the guardrails of democracy. It's also obvious, and I know you've spoken about this in the past, that Donald Trump has also identified those weak points. He is now endorsing candidates for secretary of state in battleground states, candidates who are all in on the big lie uh, in, you know, in Arizona. I think, I, think so. I think we make a mistake focusing this all on, on Donald Trump as though he's, I don't know, Magneto and some incredible supervillain that has change the very nature and uh, temperature of the United States. Like, he's just been an effective vessel. But again, like, he's not singing new songs. This is something, he's maybe singing them a little better than, you know, Goldwater. But, but I, I think it's a mistake to, to focus it all on this one individual mm -hmm. and not to focus it m more on you know, the idea that power is its own reward, whether it be in the financial industry or in government, like power doesn't seed itself. And unless we can figure out a better way to balance that power for, you know, for, for workers and voters and, and different groups, we'll be vulnerable. You know, I don't, I don't know that autocracy is purely the domain of, of Donald Trump. I think that we all have a bit of a tendency to be like, 
to grant amnesty to people that are doing things that we would prefer, even if that means that they're slightly undemocratic. I, there's many times where I think to myself, like, just do an executive order, for God's sake, just get it done. <laughs> you know, so I, I think our focus unhealthily on this one individual comes at the price of systems and dynamics that have been in place long before this cat ever learned how to surf those waves. I think that what's going on is it turns out, and we've learned a lot of this in recent decades, but especially maybe the last four or five years because Donald Trump was so disruptive and so willing uh, to challenge norms, we've learned that a lot of the American system is built on the honor system. And that only works, of course, if you care about or even have a sense of honor. And I know that, the, that you're not so much concerned about uh, an autocracy taking root as you are in the minority party figuring out how to rule despite the fact that they do not enjoy majority support. Well, I think there's always been the danger that a minority of voices would have a majority of power. I mean, in, in, in a lot of ways, that's, that's baked into the, the way that the system was created and enacted. Um, and I don't, I, I, I just think in, in general, coming up with remedies to that have proven to be really difficult because the, the larger issues is, you know, we've elevated money and, and corporate power to this one level. We've diminished sort of uh, pure democratic power to another level, and uh, we're wildly out of balance. That sounds, that's an awfully Oprah-esque way of putting the threat to the, to the republic, but I just, Jake, we're irregular. I think we're irregular <laughs> right now. We need, we need democratic fiber <laughs> to help ourselves. So... But that's not to say that you are not worried about what's going to happen in 2024. I'm worried about everything. Right. I'm constant. Of course. That's, I'm, I'm a human being. I, I try to maintain uh, a certain level of, of optimism, which I do, I think. But, yeah, I'm, when you can see a train coming at you this far away, yeah, you keep thinking, is anybody going to, are we going to put, so is anybody, are we putting a thing up or we're just going to let it <laughs> gonna come? Just going to hit? That's going to be the end of it? Uh, but boy, power doesn't ever seed itself. And, and it, it's, a difficult, it's a difficult thing to balance. Stay right there. More coming up in our conversation with Jon Stewart. His take on why Democrats can't seem to get out of their own way. That's next. Welcome back to State of the Union. I'm Jake Tapper. Here is more of our conversation with Jon Stewart. Um, it's been nine months since Joe Biden took office. Do you think he's leading the nation with the urgency you're calling for? I don't think anybody is. I don't think, I don't think, I think most of the urgency that the nation is calling for comes from the outside of Washington. It, first of all, it's, it's an overwhelming gig, clearly. Uh, we've gotten to a point with the stasis in the government that tons of the positions that you would normally need to function uh, aren't even filled anymore. Like at, at a certain point, it feels like, uh, you know, this country is that, you ever go into a deli at like 9.30 and you want a sandwich and you walk in and like they're saran wrapping all the stuff and you're like, hey man, uh, can I get a sandwich? You're like, yeah, no, no sandwich. And you're like, well, you're open till you go up to 11, you're like, yeah, yeah, but no sandwiches. We have a sandwich shop. You go, like, hey, <laughs> we're, done, we're done making sandwiches. <laughs> like, in, in some respects, that's what it feels like. And they've come up with an awful lot of good ideas, I think. And yeah. I'm hoping that some of them get implemented. But it's, it's hard to believe in the process of them getting implemented, especially when you've got one group who basically their entire governing ethos is uh, government is the enemy unless we control it. So if you control the government, we will do everything we can to make sure that it doesn't work so that we can run advertisements saying government doesn't work until we take control of it and then we get to do whatever we want. So it's, 
you know, it's pretty it's a cynical strategy. There's a big debate going on right now in the Democratic Party about how to appeal to voters in 2022. There are a lot of social issues getting a lot of attention. Governor Gavin Newsom in California just signed a law uh, requiring gender neutral toy sections in stores. Um, there's obviously a lot of debate across the country, not all, not all, all of it well informed uh, about critical race theory and how race is taught in schools. What are your, what, what, do you have concerns about how these debates are taking place? Obviously, I'm not talking about how they're depicted in, in right-wing media because they're, it doesn't matter what the Democrats do or liberals do for right-wing media to lie about it. But there are a number of independent voters who might not understand what's going on. Yeah, uh, I mean, there are a lot of things a lot of people don't understand, and it's something's either right and common sense. I mean, I do think there are ways to accomplish some of these goals uh, in ways that, but you, you can't govern to the lowest common denominator. You can't, I think one of the difficulties, and again, it's, it's with the way that the lens through which we view everything is based on, and what will that mean for the midterms? Or what? I saw a great headline in Politico as Afghanistan was descending into chaos in that final week. And uh, the headline in Politico, this was, this was the, the top line headline, the one with the 40 you know, point font, whatever it was. Uh, it said, why Afghanistan may not matter in the midterms. <laughs> And then the subhead yeah. was, and why it might. <laughs> and, wow. And, I mean, and I think they so have a point. Like, they have a point. But that's our journalism, right, man? Isn't that, like, how many times have you seen stories about the battle over masks? That's the Karen yelling in the store and the people throwing them out and all that. And how many stories have we seen about the efficacy of masks or the why? or the actual, like, there are some, but the overwhelming majority of stories seek to expose the conflict lines. But do you think it's all about the media? There isn't anything to the degree of that sometimes activists on the left risk alienating a culture instead of educating and then bringing people in? Uh, that, that's one of the criticisms. Their, their job isn't to educate necessarily. I mean, I agree with you. I'm uncomfortable with certain like activism that feels performative. I, I think a lot of times it's not particularly helpful. And if your goal is to create uh, a, a change there, sometimes that performative activism isn't particularly helpful. But in the scheme of things, performative activism gets people's attention. And if the follow-up to that conversation is fruitful, it can be really effective. But I don't generally think that the problem in democratic politics lies with activists. I just don't think that that's a fair assessment of what's wrong with, uh, you know, democratic politics. You think that it's the democratic politicians don't deliver enough to the, to the people that they were elected to represent? Is that more accurate? I think that uh, their ability sometimes to uh, respond in kind with, with smart and competent uh, programs is, is probably a bigger problem. And so everybody wants to talk about, like that question you said about gender neutral, I can't remember what you said, gender neutral Sections and in toys, stores. toy stores. It's a, it's a law that the governor just passed and, and signed into right. law. But honestly, like that law, like who gives a shit? Like it's, do you know what I mean? Like in terms of the importance of the running of California. Yeah, it's a law. Who's it really going to impact? It reminds me of, you know, somebody said to me that they were upset the other day that it had, things had gotten so out of hand. Oh, Demi Lovato wanted to be referred to as they. That was the pronoun that Demi Lovato wanted to use. And, and this person went, uh, you know, this is just, it's out of hand. And I said, well, I've, I've got really good news for you then. You don't know Demi Lovato. <laughs> So you're never going to have to really be in this situation. And whatever protein, pronoun you use in conversation, she will be fine because you don't know Demi Lovato. And if you ever did meet Demi Lovato and you use the wrong pronoun, I'm sure Demi Lovato would be like, oh, oh, I'm sorry, I prefer this one. 
and, and it, then it would be good done. But in the media, that story is ubiquitous. And it's, I think the media does a terrible job at de-escalation. Yeah. And, and de-escalation is the antidote to all this nonsense. And I don't mean civility, and I don't mean nonpartisanship. I mean focusing on things that are more urgent and elemental in people's lives and really hammering away at those things. Yeah. Rather than purely the emotional fault lines that occur in societies. And for our show, like, we just wanted to do a show about burn pits. Right. And why it was that these individuals that fought for this country weren't getting the health care and benefits that they earned, all because there were bureaucratic processes in place that were pretending that sleeping next to uh, 10 acre pits filled with hazardous materials burning with jet fuel wouldn't give you diseases. Now that you've done a show about it and talked to mm -hmm. the Secretary of Veterans Affairs, Dennis McDonough, and, and uh, it, it, was a, it was a great episode and you interviewed some real American heroes, but also you came face to face with somebody, Dennis McDonough, who while well-meaning could not give you an answer as to why he couldn't just okay these complaints, these um, filings from veterans who now have diseases that almost certainly they caught because they were sleeping next to this toxic cloud for a year in Iraq or Afghanistan. Coming face to face with it, what was that like? I mean, what you come face to face with is, is the reality of the stasis and the reality of money and the reality of bureaucratic processes that are not necessarily in place to usher in better care and service for wounded veterans, but are in place to protect a status quo where it functions more like an insurance company. And so what I find illuminating about those conversations is Kind of going back to the conversation we had earlier about the, the, you know, the fragile points in a democracy, right? Well, once you can identify where the bottleneck is or what the obstacle is, then you've got a fighting chance at being able to overcome it in a way that accomplishes the goals or at least improves the goals uh, that you're trying to uh, that you're trying to achieve. The, the last time I interviewed you, you said you always have hope for America, and you still seem to be hopeful. But, but a lot has happened since then. The big lie, the insurrection, the worst days of the pandemic. There are a lot of people out there for whom it probably seems very dark out there at times. A lot of people out there might feel despair, uh, not hope for the future because of the pandemic, because of the state of American democracy, because of the threats to American democracy. Where does your hope come from? Perspective, context. From, from realizing that uh, it's not supposed to be a straight line to progress. It never has been, and that there's ebb and flow, and, and you take steps back. But we've come through, you know, I was, I was, of age in the 60s, you know, my first memories of Martin Luther King Jr. and Robert Kennedy being killed. And uh, so we are a complicated people and it's a complicated story in America. And we like to mythologize it because it makes us a little bit more comfortable. But the, to be able to see things clearly is not to be despairing, but to be optimistic that 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 fair-minded people, you know, working together can make incremental progress over time. And that ain't nothing. And that, and that real people making real decisions can change things. And overwhelmingly, I still believe that it, this is an experiment worth having. And, and uh, you know, admittedly, the country feels right now like it's in kind of a joint custody arrangement. Like sometimes you stay with dad, sometimes you stay with mom and, and, and we go through it. But 
Why wouldn't you be optimistic? What name another time you'd rather be alive? Just, I, I can't think of one. And yeah, is social media annoying? Yes. Would I rather be alive in the 40s? No. Like this is, think of the opportunities. Think of, have you met younger people? There's some of them are brilliant. Yeah, they're Coming great. Up with all kinds of great stuff. They're pretty and I'm great. I'm sure there's a couple of evil geniuses out there too, and we're going to have to deal with their nonsense. But for the most part, everybody's doing the best they can. And there's a lot of uh, uh, really powerful energy and vitality being put towards trying to make stuff better. So, so I prefer to think that they will be triumphant, but that it's not a fait accompli, that, that we are not guaranteed anything. And if you look at it like you're not guaranteed anything, there is no entitlement in a society to progress or making things better. But if there's enough people that feel invested in accomplishing that, it can be done. Even if it's on a local level, it can be done. How can you not feel good, Jake Tapper? Feel good. <laughs> I do. I feel good after that. I've, I really do. I honestly do. The show is The Problem with John Stewart. It's on Apple TV+. And, uh, John, it's always, it's always great to have you. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot, Jake. Good talking to you. Fareed Zakaria is next.